that's fine. Yeah. Sometimes you forget. I don't know if you've ever done like a Zoom and you just forget to record or something. It's like, well, that was just impermanent in the moment. Yeah. But this this idea of integration, I'm really fascinated by, and I'm sure as a as a role for like it's such a big piece that maybe gets not spoken about many other areas of body. And I think it's it's sectioned out as we were talking about before before we started recording. Um, Molly Bloom's dad, the heart surgeon, is integrating how the heart works, which is trust, respect, and communication, and learning how psychiatry and heart surgery works together. He's integrating the whole thought process of a human being rather than I'm a heart surgeon and this is how I get billed and paid because the insurance company also segments mm. hearts, arms, legs, <laughs> kidneys, <laughs> have nots. So when we think about integration and doing barefoot running, I think about how does your ilia look with your sacrum? <laughs> um, I had a client come in yesterday. She said that her SI joint is fused on the right side to her ilia or so. Here, let me get a pelvis. Yay. I love that you have all the things. It's, yeah. <laughs> so her SI joint here is fused. Most people, this, I wish this pelvis moved, it goes back and forth, but it, hers is completely fused just like how this pelvis is. And this side is completely mobile. So I asked her, I said, oh, how's your neck then? And she looked at me and she's like, oh my God, I've had neck problems my entire life. Wow. So when I look at Ilya's, when, I, when someone talks to me about their foot, I look at this joint, which is your SI joint, sacrum, ilia starts with an I. So that's when people say like, I have SI problems, they're talking about their sacrum and their ilia, but they'll point like, you know, right here, which is so cute. Mm -hmm. So that's why I always am like, so do, which point to me where your SI joint is? And they're like, it's right here. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> great. So then I just go, I just let their language go over my head and I'm like, it's their sacrum. Great. They're pointing at their sacrum. So their sacrum is more of an issue than their ilia. So when people start doing, going into barefoot stuff, they also have this conversation about how much of my foot can I use? Because they're not used, you were probably used to like not dancing on rocks and doing the things that you do now, as you said in a lot of your videos, like it took me time to build up here, but it also took this bone time to allow the drop to happen in the weight of your foot, in the weight of your heel in the back. This is responsible for the back of the heel and the front of the hip is responsible for the front of the hip. Cool. So essentially, when we walk, this is an ilia. I've just taken it off of my skeleton. Mm -hmm. But this is the right side. If I'm walking, I want this ilia, This leg is going to go back, and the front of the ilia is going to go forward. So that means your toes have to trust that that your hip can drop it down or that your hip can trust that it can trust that you don't have barefoot shoes on mm. or that you don't have shoes on <laughs> that you don't have barefoot shoes on versus tennis shoes or any kind of shoe you're willing to take a full stretch of a gait okay so like all the way down you can do that with shoes versus barefoot running you have to actually start getting used to a new gait versus like when you first started walking on rocks or pavement it was kind of like this kind of walk like yeah. really short kind of waddly right yeah. look what it's doing though, the whole rest of my structure mm. oh like yeah, oh. <laughs> so but months later six months later you were now walking right so now i have contralateral motion uh, yeah which is what we look at in rolfing how the heck does that person have where is contralateral motion showing up where is it not Wow. So, so when we think about, go ahead. Oh, oh I was just going to ask that just to back up a tiny bit, the word gait gets used so much in body movement and foot and natural gait. Could you like explain that? Like just that word, like break that word down essentially. So here's a big leg. Okay. Here's the whole thing. This is what your whole thing is. It's not even attached to your sacrum because this is the whole leg appendicular like your shoulder blade because there can even be an arm gate if you want to talk about it so here's your appendicular system 
the shoulder blade, the collarbone and the arm, the hip and the leg and the femur in the bottom, right? These two things are separate from the center. So when we talk about gait, thinking about how much this leg moves forward and back from the socket up top. Sometimes people's gaits are really short, right? Or yeah. they can be really long, especially when, so when we talk about a running gait, it's gonna be a lot longer than a walking gait. So I think of gait is how much length or distance do you have when kicking your foot forward and then pushing back and how much of that leg that you're on, how much is it stable and how long can it stay stable while pushing through your foot to start the next gate on the other foot. Mm. Walking is a form of falling. Yeah. Running is a form of fast, fast falling. You're catching that's, yourself constantly with each step. That's what a lot of barefoot runners really talk about that I feel like isn't spoken about in regular running as much. But with barefoot running, it's like this idea of you're just like, yeah, like using gravity, essentially, just keeping your feet, your feet are kind of like churning under you in a sense. And it definitely changed my perspective mm -hmm. of running versus I see, I watch people run all the time now. I watch people run on the beach and even seeing people like on the beach with shoes, it's, it's kind of this whole different paradigm for me now to see. It's like almost confusing. Um, but I see the difference in people that are exerting a ton of pressure and taking these gigantic strides and pushing off really hard versus people that are light on their feet. And I've had to kind of learn to shift to more of this so, light on my feet kind of thing. Instead of being light on your feet, I would expand on the thought process of, you already said the word pressure with your feet. Mm -hmm. how, how much pressure or how much of your toes do you feel like you're using when you are walking, when you are running? Your toes are what keep you light on your feet. Your toes are an extension of your cervicals, your neck. There's a joke that I had a, my mentor said, your toes are the underbelly of your eighth cervical. And I'm like, Sue, we only have seven. She's like, that's the point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> your toes are your eighth cervical. Is like, oh. doing. <laughs> and I went to a workshop um, with a, a man, Kevin Frank and Karen, they're both certified rolfers and advanced rolfers, somatic therapists, a lot of stuff. And we did wall work and we would do underbellies of the toe work and get the wall to accentuate the tail and then accentuate the head. So essentially when you allow the toes to express, the tail then expresses backwards. It's a natural phenomenon that we want to happen. It is an extension of the bottom of the pelvic floor or essentially, Every time I take a step, this should go out. Mm. Then that's what happens anyway. Like if I take a step forward with my right foot, my tail does try to go back. And if I watch my back foot behind me, when I press into my toes, my booty goes, whoop, it does that. <laughs> it goes back because it's recoil for your spine to control lateral rotate so that this leg can then pop and do it again. And in, in the case of the person you're talking about that had their hip was fused, is that just by their movement or is that like a surgery, some sort of surgical process that they went under? Um, so it happens some, she's like a case of like 2% of population in the world where her sacrum and the ilia fused. Um, it's because she's had neck issues for a long time. It sounds like it's been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen a bone like this in person out of actually of one of my Rolfer's offices. He's like, this is a case that you'll see once in a lifetime. And I'm like, and then three wow. years later, here it comes walking in. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So for her case, there's no surgery. It just fused on its own, the bones together, probably found a reason to do that for something that happened probably during birth or during her um, younger, younger ages, she might've fallen off of something and it just smacked so hard that it just started fusing together. There's a lot of cases of how it can happen. Yeah, and I asked so for that, her, 
Go ahead. No, I was just going to say I asked that because I'm aware of like wearing the wrong footwear, for example, or sitting at a desk all day. I'm sure a lot of the cases and people that you work with, maybe they're just whether they haven't learned how to walk properly or they're sitting all day, like it kind of shifts how your whole body is or people that are like on the mm -hmm. phone just naturally changes and then you have to kind of help them get back to what's natural. So what I, for the person that has this fused piece, I'm still working on her toes. Like where can she find her toes to get some portion of her bones and her hips to move? Training the underbellies of the toes or sensing into the underbellies of the toes is not only delicious, but it's also informative to what's in your ears and eyes. So there's crystals in our ears that keep us up and our eyes also keep us up. And they're constantly looking at our ankles for support and our toes for support. Toes, ankles, eyes, and ears are all working together to keep your pretty little self vertical. So when we see the difference of a barefoot runner versus a shoe runner, shoe runners don't get the extension or the expression of their toes because as you've seen or um, in one of your videos you posted up with like the shoe x-ray that I had and you did yeah, as well yeah. you can see that the toes are curled or crunched and so either curled or crunched based upon people's feet they still don't have availability of their toes at all and then their heel is lifted and it's mm -hmm. like so that and then their arches fall mm -hmm. or the two ends of the bridge are going, oh, what the fuck? And then people get high arches. Mm. So that's what happens with people's stuff is mm. it either gets too high or too low. And when you get too low, then you have to express the toes to start getting the arch to work. It's always easier to build an arch than it is to tear one down. So then when you have a high arch person, you're allowing that person to understand how to find their toes from from outside sources, essentially like if your toes were to smell flowers <laughs> versus your toes trying to feel where the comfort is above and below the toes. So you have a difference of flat-footed people and high-arched people, but everyone needs to learn how to express through their toes because it's an extension again of your cervicals, which gets you more balance and ease in your eyes and ears anyway. So I would suggest toe running or the expression of your toes and understanding how that velocity shows up in your spine and how your spine then is the engine to get your legs to keep going. There was a beautiful paper that was written, um, are the legs the engine or do the legs feed the wolf or does the spine feed the wolf essentially? And they did all this biomechanical stuff and research and they had their theories about really how the legs fed the wolf. It doesn't work that way because our toes are an expression of our eighth cervical, then the spine is the engine. But you can't ignite an engine without a key, essentially. You need a start button. Nowadays, you either turn it on or start it. <laughs> yeah, just walk in and speak to it. <laughs> right, it doesn't just work. So you have to find a way to express how your spine works and in barefoot, you have more expression of that because you don't have anything on your feet. This is why your feet have changed so much. And you're like, why my feet look like monkey feet? And I'm like. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely been such a change. And also learning about how the shoe is almost designed. Most shoes like can be designed backwards because the, the toes are meant to spread out more. And then the foot right, gets like thinner as it goes. But we kind of put these shoes on that crunches the toes together like you were saying and messes with mm -hmm. the heel and it's just interesting to hear your perspective of like i sometimes get so caught up in the foot but it really is like this, this is the foundation piece but it's attached to your whole body so how it affects everything else yeah right. it's fascinating well i think it's interesting too that people think like when i ask people where where is your ankle what is the arch of your foot they give me completely different answers than i think but I know are the ankle or the arch of the foot. So when I ask people like, what is the ankle? They'll usually point at the sides right here. But last I checked, this is the fibia. This is the tibia. So that's, those are, that's your whole shin. 
but the actual ankle itself is in the middle, your talus. And it's pretty awkward looking. It's the most awkward looking bone you've ever seen mm. in your life, but it connects to the heel mm. everywhere. And if you look it up yourself, just the talus bone, it's so awkward looking. But what's great about the talus is that it connects to the arch of the foot in all three directions. And some people also say, Kayla, this is the arch of the foot, the inside of the foot. And I go, oh, nope, we're gonna look over here. This is the true arch of the foot, the outside, the cuboid, why? Because if you look, this guy rolls most of, like quote unquote a correct foot. This guy rolls onto the cuboid, which is the outside. Or I like to think of, there's two ways to look at this. The cuboid is like mama, the navicular is like papa. And they have three children, cuneiform one, cuneiform two, cuneiform three. Which one has a little bit more rotation in this foot? And how can also this rotate to push and to push in both directions. Whenever I walk on cobblestone, my ankles feel the best and my back loves it because my foot actually gets to do this, mm. what it's supposed to and meant to do. So barefoot walking, barefoot running, this is why all of us just can't wait to take off our shoes or some of us now are permanently saying, no, thank you, <laughs> because it feels nice. <laughs> mm. So when we think about letting a finding the arch of the foot, we want to allow these, allow Papa to lift the kids up and bring them to mama essentially mm. so that mama can keep rotating and moving this joint around. Cause I mean, essentially we're all figuring out that women kind of run the household, right? That. So that's yeah. kind of my example that I like to use with my clients is there's, it looks like a lot of bones in here but there's only five big players mm. in the front. Mama, Papa, three kids. And then, then you have their house, the talus. And then you have the foundation, which is the um, heel. Can't think of what the heel is called right now. I'm losing it. It's okay. Yeah. I like it. I like the Mama and Papa. This is how I prefer to learn anyway. Yeah, it's more fun. Perfect. Yeah. I like ways to look at it and then this is just their extended long their extended <laughs> lawn <laughs> that needs to be a garden <laughs> so these guys are an extension of how it feeds the family which is the toes or the underbellies of the toes the toes feed the family so that this can actually literally move and then send information up top and then when we think about settling a lot of us don't settle some of us have even heard of like heel striking. Mm -hmm. Heel stri striking can also be associated um, with letting go and coming down. And a lot of us either strike too much on our heel, we come up, but some of us, there's not a lot of like communication with our heel or a lot of feeling into the heel. People are really focused on this part of the foot. But I notice a lot of people don't give two eonces about this face. And I've had a couple of clients that I've been curious about because like they get surgery here or they break this piece that's hanging off the side and then it gets jungled in here. So then that in my head is a role for them like, oh, the relationship to the, the heel to the back, which then allows our knee to bend. Because mm. that's what I see when I see this space get really clogged is that the knee really can't bend because also the front and the back of the talus are not able to move. So there also becomes this relationship with the heel. And I haven't ran in a while, so I'm, hard, I'm having a hard time thinking about running and what I do when I run. But I, when I think about walking, it's heel strike or heel landing or heel pawing. Because I like to think that I have paws rather than striking the ground, because striking yeah. the ground can be really hard. So how can we paw our way through our foot and then push off through the big toe. The big toe is the last push. And it's also the extent, extension of your psoas muscle in the front of your spine or the toas connection. Toas. 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 Um, so if I push my big toe 
or if I press onto the underbellies of just the four toes, I get somewhat of the hip extension. I go back on my heel and then press to the underbellies of the toes and then roll to the big toe. Look how much further I just got. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I'm taking a breath. That's nice. <laughs> and your psoas is connected to your diaphragm through the crua. And then that's why I just took a big breath because your diaphragm and psoas are connected through the main crew, as I like to call them like the boat crew. Mm. Can't have a good crew without a good crew. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have everybody fucking available to make that crew work. Meaning your big toe so that this crew can be up at 6 a.m. with all the protein and shit it fucking needs. <laughs> <laughs> I, used to, I, I used to row crew in college for a couple of years. And one thing someone used to say was like, you're only as fast as the weakest rower or the slowest rower. Because like that, it, like if everyone's not in sync, it's like the, whatever thing that's off is going to like create the maximum you know, mobility. So it seems like case of the foot, totally. you know, something's not right or something's out of sync that affects the rest of the experience. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, maybe that's why I called it the main crew. Like only, mm -hmm. I need to remember that only as fast as one. your weakest link. Yeah. You're only as fast as your, as your slowest rower. Like that's, that's huge. So like, if you're not getting all the links, like when I practice this, I also, when I forget about my toes, I will practice slowly walking mm. and then really like try to accentuate a little bit, like almost over accentuate to the point where I can kind of speed up and feel how I'm doing that. Yeah. And it might take a couple of weeks to actually build up the sensation of how am I rolling through my toes to push and reach. It's different. Yeah. And, and, well, and we'll the... that. Go ahead. Oh, well, I was going to say what I've seen with running is like, it is this, just being completely aware because the body it seems is trying to communicate with us. And I learned a lot of this from you and going to doing a lot of sessions. I think we're coming up on our session, maybe eight. Um, but like just really listening to the body and talking with it because it's trying to tell me like, just make this slight adjustment, you know? And that's where like, I learned so much in running. Like if something feels a little achy or off, I just try to relax and like really tune into what, what do I need? And it, it usually works out versus like, make just assuming I have a problem and then I need to like get it fixed. It's like just these little subtle listenings open everything up for me. Subtly looking at our structure is supportive. Our breath is more important because it, it's the informer. It's the flexor, the extensor. The reason why we have extensors and flexors is because of our diaphragm. Mm. This is why people are like breath work is so important. It kind of fucking is. <laughs> Excuse very, me, it actually really is. It's very, yeah. Um, so when, because it frustrates me even with my um, content, not only as a rolfer, but also as a sex therapist or a sex educator of coming is letting go for women. It's literally just dropping it. And for years, I did this. I tightened. And no wonder I couldn't get the orgasm that I was looking for because I was constantly contracted. So when I look at bodies in how do we find ourselves when we're in a situation of something feels funny, just keep finding your breath and look at it as an image, like an image that you like, because our body responds to images rather than it responds to itself. This is why we have fascia because fascia is a proprioceptive organ. It takes up 70% of who we are. It's constantly the radar system of where am I? How am I? Am I doing okay? Hmm. Is that safe? Yeah. <laughs> so when we think about adjusting a body part, that it's an old way of thinking because that's what we were conditioned with thinking in anatomy, physiology in high school and college. And then when we get out in the real world, we're like, whoa, this place is so much bigger. And then we get really small again with our actions. But if we stayed this way, when we work out and we're feeling our running or walking, then this actually just stays in line. And this is what my mentor has been trying to drill me in for the last three years of knowing her. Quit looking at the structure and putting it places. Mm. Notice how you go out so then you can receive space inside. Mm. And I'm like, that's hard. And she's like, I know. Yeah. You'll appreciate, you'll appreciate <laughs> this. I had, I, uh, last year I was with this guy who was a rolfer and he was more of the old school style. And 
um, just like I've, I've kind of done both and just from learning with you where it, there is this subtlety to it. And I asked him about kind of the difference and he's like, well, I was taught like we just change bodies, you know, and it's just like very, it, this is a very painful, like really, I mean, he did like a little thing on my shoulder. It's like very, you know, arms and, and all this stuff. And he said, we would just change bodies. And I'm sure there's like, there's a power to that. But like, I was really fascinated when I started learning about your style, which is much more of a, yeah, it felt more expansive. It felt more like this bot, like body talk communication, um, which right. has now, like, even when I'm stretching, I, you know, I grew up stretching and it was playing football and wrestling. It was very like, you're, you're down, ten, nine, eight, and then you do this. And it was very like strong. And now when I stretch, it's like, I'm taught being much more slow and just kind of like yeah. being aware and speaking. And I'm like, sometimes I'll just sit here for a while and then like slowly just let it open up. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, it's like mushroom land. Mm. I feel like it's mushroom friend a little bit. Um, I remember having this epiphany last year I was on mushrooms and I, I specifically wanted to do mushrooms by myself and put blindfolds on and headphones and then just be. And I got to this space where I was like, I just wanted to like finally curl up and then there was this like twitch. And I was like, what's that? And I noticed that I was noticing my environment to like cue me to actually like, you know, I'm fine right here. Oh wait, that's really curious. Which one's better? You know, structs are staying here. Oh, curiosity. And then I watched myself come out and it was like all these colors like came out and like it was just a, such a different expression because I'm, weight is relaxing and it tells you that you're here. But our fascial system is very curious. It's very like, fluttery almost like a foggy morning or like the day after a snowstorm it's just like it's it's constantly looking for like some form of going out and then trying not to resist with grabbing because some people can go to a place of oh my focus is my shoulder or my rib hurts whatever but when i get them out of what's focusing and what's actually grabbing then we can release the grab and it releases what they're focusing on because it's what you're focusing on is structure and not you're not looking at the proprioception of what you might be holding on to holding hold it grasping like so when you actually go into the pattern of pre-movement rather than distraction you actually reorganize the body a lot better and it's a, it's a matter of seeing too, of like, oh, I see that person grabbing there. And then with myself, when I try to do this, I'm like, oh, I noticed this rib cage. So what if, what if I film myself and see if I grab on the right somewhere? And I'll start, I'll start walking and I'll stop, start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. So that I can see my habitual pattern of where I organize before I organize. How do I organize before I organize? And that's the biggest thing that Rolfers in the past missed because they didn't take enough Rolf movement or Rolf movement wasn't available to them yet and it hadn't been designed yet. Like, so now you have Kevin Frank, second, first, first, first generation Rolf movement teacher, and I'm second generation. Like, mm -hmm. we're still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> but also, my mentor from a long time ago, she's first year generation. And she, that's how I ran into her. And I was like, all she did was come up to my table and say, let's have fun. And I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> what are we gonna do? <laughs> Cause I felt like the structure work was so dogmatic to me as a person, even though I'm pretty rough as a person, like in my own personal life, but it doesn't mean I need to be rough on people's bodies and demanding people's bodies to change. How dare you? <laughs> but asking them to change how, thank you. Mm. Where yeah. can you go? It's like the mushroom experience. Are you curious about this? Are you curious about that? Yeah, you know, I think it's very answer. interesting. Like when we plan a run, we're like, oh, I want to do this trail. And then you actually wake up that day and you're like, no, I really want to go south instead of east. Listen to it. Like there's a reason why you want to go that way. Your body's like, ah. The That's how I feel with this training stuff. I actually met some guy recently and he was, I told him I was getting ready for this marathon and he had run some marathons before all shod marathons and streets but he was telling me about his process of how he trained and it was like like 
if that was like what I, if my mind went into that, I would have never run because it was very like, okay, first we're going to do it at 10K at this exact pace. And then we're going to stop for five minutes and then we're going to run a 20K at this pace. And then and halfway through, it's like he had this whole sheet on his arm that he would run with. And it was every calculated to like the minute of how fast he should be running and how much. And I was like, I just enjoy running because it's fun. And I just get on the trail and I just start going. Like yesterday I did 13 miles and I didn't have any plan. I was like, maybe I'll do a couple of miles run to the beach. And I just felt great and just kept running. And I'm not doing it to beat some kind of time or to like prove something to myself other than that running feels good. And it's more of like this dance and this flow and my body really craves it. And that was the thing that same with the barefoot thing. I didn't like talk, hear someone talk about being barefoot and was like, that sounds cool. I want to do that. It was like, I was out on the trails and something inside of me was like, just take off your shoes. You know, just like this little whisper of like, get rid of those and just see what happens. And I did it and I was like, oh, this isn't so bad. And then like after 10 minutes, it was kind of hurting and I put my feet back on or whatever. But then over time, it just became so obvious. And it's like that listening, that subtlety that you're talking about, that breath. Yeah. The, the tuning in has been the thing that has taught me so much. And I'm always, I'm reading books, I'm listening to podcasts, I'm talking to people. But it's really at the end of the day, like there's so much information out there and being able to tune in has been so helpful because I can listen to these little subtleties. Even when I run, like it's, you have right. to be, when you're running barefoot, you have to be so aware and people will comment if you've seen some stuff, like I'll post a video and like, well, what about glass? Like, or, or needles? And it's like, yeah, there are plenty of things that in any situation that you have to look out for, but like it actually slows you down because I have to be so aware of every step. And we were out in the mountains last week and they're saying, be aware of snakes, be aware of snakes. And I think the first thought, maybe for anyone, myself included, is like, oh, barefoot, that's going to be even more of a thing with snakes. But actually, it's less because I'm so aware of every step. There's no chance that I'm going to step on a snake out in the mountains. Whereas in the past, I've come into close encounters with snakes because I was a lot less mindful and just kind of trudging through. Um, so, yeah, it's that, mm -hmm. it is that awareness that's been really powerful and that listening. Yeah. And even like, I've, as I'm hearing you say this, I'm like, I've heard so many people get snake bites through their shoes. Yeah. And if you're looking at every, if you're like aware of your surroundings, you know, they have to be mindful. Everything yeah. is mindfulness. I think that's what ultimately what Ida Rolf had in mind was not only to ch allow change to happen and integrate in your life, but to allow awareness to be something that you are now aware of like I've had 410 series now I'm aware when my body is out by a millimeter maybe a half a millimeter yeah. it's annoying <laughs> but also I'm like oh but Kayla you didn't have that long time ago well look at that treasure yeah. and because like when I go home to my parents they're just like you're just so aware of everything and I'm like oh, thank you I worked so hard on that <laughs> Uh, yeah. I really did for seven years now. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I did it. I, I took my, my partner does teaches breath work and we talk about that a lot because she's so aware of her breath and she's like, you know, like my breath is off. And I'm like, I don't think it's so much of that off, it's that you're so aware. And it's like someone that grew up I grew up eating fast food. And to me it was just normal. But when you start becoming aware of how your body feels, suddenly it's the same thing. If I eat something a little bit off. My stomach, it doesn't have to be in like terrible pain like it used to be, but if I feel the slightest bit of something, I'm like, that's not right, you know, and I start focusing on it. But yeah, it is interesting with awareness that. Well, it, it, and the beautiful thing about it with it, cause it's like, it doesn't matter what you're aware of, being aware is awareness. And some people are like, well, being, well, you just have to be aware and they kind of throw the word awareness around. So I'm wondering if we can almost change it and mean like, no, I'm just that in tuned. Yeah. I'm really in tune. Cause I feel like, like instrumentally, like when something's in tune, it's perfect. It's like, yeah. that's the sound I'm looking for. But sometimes finding awareness that it's out of tune is just not enough as I'm talking about it. So I'm sitting here thinking about it and even in my own work and I'm like, wow, I'm aware of these problems, but can I be more in tune with the actual subtlety of the awareness, just like the mushroom piece of like, okay, I feel that going on. Oh, it's still going on. Do I care? Am I curious? Oh, now I'm really curious. What the fuck is that? So it's like being in tune with actually what you're curious about, because there's a lot to be aware of, right? 
So she can even be aware of like, well, how is your, how is the roof of your mouth responding with the breath? And how is the bottom of the pelvic floor responding to breath? Because people can be aware of their breath, but they're, are they looking at the cranial breath? Are they looking at the sacral breath? Are they looking at the container? Because your, your breath expands down into the pelvic floor and at the same time that it raises your cranial diaphragm. So I think, again, people get focused on breath work on one thing and they can get really aware of one thing, but how do I notice how also my breath affects the arch of my foot? Mm. That's being, you can be aware of a section, but what's the awareness of the integration of it and the, the tune and how does it really play out through what you're sensing? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also this piece of not just creating a story. Like, I, I like what you're saying about it, like a, the attunement, because sometimes it can be easy to say, okay, my foot is like, or I'll have a knee pain or something, and then make up this story about all these things that it could be. I could have a knee, you know, go into that spiral versus just having the attunement of like, oh, I'm just having this awareness of something there. I'm not attaching assumption or a story about it, but I'm just like allowing my awareness to shift to the space. And then just say, hey, buddy, what's going on? How you doing? Like, what, you know, what do right. you need? And, and, and I do that like now, like when I think some of our first sessions, I was almost thrown off because you would kind of like, you would talk, you'd be like, all right, hey, how's it going? Like talk to like different body parts. And, it, and then when I start to shift that perspective, I'm like, everything has this intelligence to it. And Fasha is intelligent and aware then it's like, yeah, we can communicate with them. And it's not just some inanimate object that's just part of our body doing our bidding. Whatever I want you to do, I raised my hand because I told you, no, like we're, it's this integrated system. Um, mm -hmm. And I, it's one that, that, just to go to the breath thing for a second, um, you know, when, before I met uh, my partner, Aja, you know, I started getting into like some of this pranayama, Wim Hof kind of breathing and, and getting a lot of benefits and power out of it. And that she was trained in that rebirthing style and like the, but then over time she started getting into restorative breath work and more innate natural breath. And that was really what, like, just like learning a lot from her and, and seeing her go through these different processes and teachings, seeing like the, the power of that and like actually just having this awareness of breath because we can be in a breath work session for an hour and have this and generate a ton of energy and that can be powerful but then you have 23 hours for the rest of your day and how is your breath connected to every other part? So it really has been in the process of me learning how to run and also learning how to really just stay calm in my breath that has um, been powerful. So I like your perspective of like, how are you breathing and, in relation to your ankle? You know? This is a thing, uh, volume is a thing, right? So we have a container and then we have our appendages, right? We have two systems for a reason, appendicular, arms and legs, and we have axial complex. So in the first session that I now do in my office after coming back from Kevin Frank's work last September, thank God he freaking had a workshop during COVID because he changed my whole life. Like that man changed my fucking life. He's like, y'all, why are you putting back diaphragms and not putting back the heel and toes? And I'm like, oh! <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Kevin, okay, Kevin, how do we do it? Kevin, how do we do it? And he's like, okay, on an inhale, our eyes go up. It's an intrinsic movement. Don't do this when you're running. On an exhale, your <laughs> eyes go down, right? So um, I do, do this with my clients while I'm holding their diaphragm on one side at a time. And I'll just watch their eyes and their feet are on the wall, touching the whole wall. And then after that, I'll, once I find out that their diaphragm is changing, because once their eyes move, then this gets bigger. And then once the sides are bigger, then I allow on an inhale, your toes will touch the wall or the underbellies of your toes will touch the wall. And then on an exhale, your heel will start to come to the wall, creating front, back relationship instead of side-side relationship or front body relationship, back body relationship. So in Rolfing, how do I get you into the space that you have? 
front body, how do you relate to the front of who you are? Because some people will say, oh, I, I feel, I'm really heavy heeled. Like, I feel like I live in my heels or I live in my toes. Well, where do you, how does, I don't barely ever hear anybody living in the middle. Mm. So I have my clients now on an inhale, allow their toes to express. And then on an exhale, allow their heel to express. And what I see sometimes is people will, um, when they're trying to find their heel, they'll squeeze their butt cheeks to do it. Or, or they'll push their legs into the wall. I'm like, that's not letting this bone into the wall. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't ask for your ass. I asked for your heel. Mm. So it's really interesting how people's relationship to the front and back of their diaphragm while doing their feet work changed people's bodies in my, in my office so much that I no longer do what I did for six years. Wow. Ever. I won't ever do it again because it, it doesn't work fully, fully. It lasts for only so long. Mm. Thank you, Kevin Frank. Thank you, Karen. You're the real, you are the real master behind this. So I'm taking their workshop again. Um, Karen has a workshop with Rebecca um, in July and then Kevin and Karen are teaching together in September. I have no idea what the hell I'm gonna extra learn on top of that because those two minds are brilliant. But this idea of front back relationship with the diaphragm and the feet continues the thought process because our diaphragm gets us running. It's we're ke- we have to catch ourselves in walking and running and our diaphragm gives us the energy to do that. Like <sighs> it's the front and the back relationship of going in between both and rotating. Our diaphragm's in the middle. So we have to not only focus on it, but just be aware of how our toes are expressive of our relationship to the front of who we are back of who we are and then the sides are completely different the sides are expressed by your eyes because they can express everywhere where the eyes go the spine goes right and then cranky knees are cranky toes or uneducated toes some people have knee problems i'm like how are your feet and i look at them i'm like yeah you don't even know how to wiggle your toes (laughs) these four are connected anyway but they're like how do i get separated here with their big toe, because you want to see that this can really move individually. These two have share, or these four share an extensor flexor, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah. And then I ask people like, do you use the bottom of your foot to stand up or do you use the top of your foot to stand up? And they're like, huh? Um, well, your flexors are on the bottom. So bending your knees is flexion and extending your legs is extension. Last time I checked, standing as extension. So when I was in a workshop with another um, rolfer, she said, press into the top of your feet to stand into extension. And I was like, oh, that's the simplest term I've ever heard. Press into the, the top of your feet where your extensors live to stand into extension. And I was like, and that changes a lot of people's knees. It changes people's low backs because they're not using their flexor group to extend into extension. Mm-hmm. We'll wonder why their backs are. And then Kuiper extending their knees for so many years that their backs are like, I can't handle the truth anymore. It's nowhere to be found. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what seems really powerful about the work that you do is that it is the whole body. Like you were talking about earlier, where it's just like we look at just the heart. We don't look at how there's all these other things that are playing into that. And if we're just isolating a problem, like, oh, your knees, your knee hurts, but we're going to like put it in the cast or we're going to replace it or something. Like we're not looking at the whole body. And that seems to be the obvious missing piece. And the feet, especially as the root of the foot. That's why like I'm, I'm obsessed with feet, but I'm seeing now how much it's like, yeah, if, if, I, if my foot was just in essentially, I mean, there's such a wide range of shoes and there's some that are far better than others, but my feet are in this like cast essentially and, it, and you take away all the mobility of the foot and all day I'm just doing the same motion in this like thing just like if my hands were putting mittens all day and I was trying to play guitar I'd be like it just right. wouldn't work so it the way that that throws off everything is just fascinating to me so it's like how how I sometimes took my clients in when I see them out in public and they are like hey what is rolfing I go, I ask them how much do you express through, what is the relationship to the underbellies of your toes? What is the relationship to your collarbones? What is the relationship to your rib cage in the back? And they go, I don't think I have one. 
So it's, it's a, another way to ask your own self a curiosity question. What is my relationship to this right now? And how does my whole body respond to this right now? It's, it's a fun way to be curious and also get out of our bodies because our body doesn't understand itself. Our body understands space. That's what fascia is, space. It creates space in between spaces so that people, things don't run into each other. So when people are like, my back hurts, it sounds like people are running into each other. <laughs> you know, it's there's somebody's running into somebody that's like, <laughs> why are we running into each other there's not enough space not enough space because somewhere in the fascial system it got dented and then spaces got really congested and now they're complaining and they don't have a solution until homie over here gets out of it and people will do high velocity impacts or really high forms of therapy on people to get it out and then you recognize that they're not breathing in that situation and when people are not breathing, they're not experiencing themselves. And it's also a form of fear or a triggering or, a, I don't know. So even when people are like, my body feels like it got ran over like a plow by my massage therapist after this really hard session and I wasn't breathing the entire time, that's your nervous system's telling you, don't go back there because you're in flight or flight mode, flight or fight mode when you're doing that. And this is why old school Rolfing changed people's bodies, but that's why we had the, um, the audacity to say that we changed people's bodies, I'm sorry, which they sort of did, but they didn't breathe the entire time, which that's what whole, the whole purpose of session one was about. And so Kevin Frank has walked that statement and like if session one is about the breath and if fascia is a proprioceptive organ, then this is the way that we actually need to do things. Get big, guys. This is why Rolf movement became a, a next chapter for people, or how Feldenkrais method came out of the, the woodworks, or Alexander technique, or um, Bonnie Cohen's, like Bonnie Bonnie B. Cohen's. He's like the biggest movement practitioner in the whole world, and she's in her 80s, still pushing out trainings, and they're all about movement of babies and how do babies move, and that's how we need to remember how to move. We need to remember also how to breathe like babies and there you see a baby reach with one arm and then push with the opposite leg and go across many joints to go through the spine to do it it's beautiful yeah, yeah in every it's... single yoga class they tell you to keep your legs straight inhale halfway lift move from your pelvis exhale forward fold and then you don't hear a bending of the knee and then every movement practitioner in the whole world that has a movement practice and that sells movement, not yoga goes, ah, <laughs> bend your knees. <laughs> oh yeah. Where the knees bend, the spine bends. And like, so we have these practices that have even gotten to like a billion dollar industry that's helping a lot of people, but still there's no form, there's no functional pattern movements in there. And as a functional movement practitioner, I go, I don't teach yoga anymore, but I got, I'm certified in yoga but I don't teach anymore. Yeah, there's, I mean, yoga, yoga is like become the gateway drug for a lot of other types of movements. So I think that there's a, like, especially modernized, westernized yoga. I think that there's something really powerful about it, but I don't really like to do yoga anymore because what I've, I've seen is just become this carte blanche thing that's just thrown in. Like anytime you're at a retreat center or a place, or there's always just like, yeah, we can do yoga. And it's like, there's so many different styles of yoga. and, and for my body, if I'm just going from person to person, from different class to different class, it's like it can actually be detrimental in some cases because it seems like you're just in a lot of teachers, you're just flowing through these movements really quickly instead of like really letting the body take the time. Um, so I think like I've, I've learned a lot from yoga that I incorporate into a lot of things that I do, but it just seems like a lot of classes and a lot of teachers have become very like, okay, go to, go to this and then this and then this and this. And, and suddenly I'm like, I'm not even really ever feeling one of them where I could sit in like warrior for a long time and like be really subtle with it. Yeah. Um, I love this. Cause I hear this from um, my older clients and also my fiance is 14 years older than I am. And he says the exact same thing. He's like, my favorite classes are the slow ones. He's like, I can actually feel and keep up and, and integrate what I need to. And I'm like, 
this is a man that's not like he's a mechanic for a living and teaches mechanics at a college so for for this like basic joe schmo to be like i can't feel anything i'm like that is so great to hear from your from your gender and from your profession that you want to slow down and feel yeah. like that's great because then it's not you're saying to me that it's not just a workout for you it's, it's a form of how do I feel myself and I think people go to yoga I know I definitely went to yoga of like this feels good and I and I want to like work out and then I started looking it is gateway drug god damn it <laughs> <laughs> um, so it made me really understand what it is to be not Kayla not this body but to learn the, the gesture of expression and what that means to have an expression and gesture mm-hmm. in certain parts of our bodies. And before I go, we can even think about, because I have a client at 1130 or 1115 or something. Um, we can think about the feet muscles are not really in the feet. They're all in the shins. Mm-hmm. All these muscles that make these feet work have the ends of them are here, but they live up here with their attachments to the leg. There's a saying that got me into rolfing that I'll never forget. You don't have flat feet, you have flat shins. And I was like, oh! (laughs) Because they might be flat up top. So these muscles that live under here wrap around the ankle and then we'll go to the back here, or they'll attach themselves to the inner osseous membrane that's in between here, which is basically like a shock absorber. So around the corner, we like to call them Tom, Dick, and Harry so that we can keep them aligned, but all the extensor flexor digitorum and stuff like that are down here, like uh, extensor hallucius, Harry, and then uh, D is digitorum. So you're just trying to get all of these muscles to release. So when people like massage the bottom of their feet, it feels really good. But when you actually release the back of the calf and the bottom of the heel together, then it expands. But sometimes people don't have that sensation. And this is why when people are like, can I do this with a tennis ball and get it out? I'm like, it'll work for like 10 minutes. Mm. But you need some body or a wall and then possibly something underneath your knee to actually feel what's going on in this space to understand how the foot works. Because the foot is the shin and the shin is the foot. So when we think about extending through our toes and feeling, we're also feeling stuff back here, firing and moving around. And also the front. So the extensors live on the front of the shin. The flexors live on the back of the shin or the back of the calf. And there's two layers to the shin. You have your deep compartment, which is your toe compartment, the digitorum compartment. And then you have your flexor compartment, which is the soleus and the gastra. I don't even have a picture of that. Actually, there is a picture of that. Holy shit, look at that. I'm like, is that what I'm looking for? It is. What kind of look like it? I got excited. Yeah, hold on. Look at that book. Dang. So, this is what people are used to seeing. This is the calf, hmm. right? And that's a pretty common thing. But if you look down here, that's where they all go. Hmm. Wow. And then this is a deeper compartment, the digitorum compartment. You can see that there. There goes, there goes Dick. Oh wow! And they spread out to the toe. Okay, there goes Dick. Or yeah, Tom, Dick, and Harry. Yeah, I got it right. Okay, and then so all of these live on the back of the shin. There's the knee. They all live back here. So when people are like, "Kayla, my feet hurt. Why are you touching my calf?" Hold on, Harry. <laughs> Hold my Harry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Hold and, on. <laughs> and the, 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 the flat footed thing seems to be that something, I know you got to run in a second, but I get this question all the time. I'm just curious, like, or maybe a last thing. People say, like, I want to go barefoot, but I have flat feet. And I, I mean, I grew up with flat feet, but I am curious from your perspective of like that. Tell them to just go get rolfed because that's the only way that you can actually build it up because those muscles have flattened. 
the muscles have flattened. It has nothing to do with their bones. Their bones are being held up by muscle extensor flexors, right? And that flexor is a flat rubber band. Mm. Now your foot is flat. You need somebody like me that knows what the fuck they're doing. Excuse my French. And I'm just going to be really direct. Just like get somebody that really knows what they're doing. Massage therapists are, are literally there to relax you. Mm. That says, that's why it says, go get a relaxing massage. And then when you actually want something fixed, you go to your chiropractor or you go to a rolfer or an osteopath because they actually say in their mission statements, we put people back together and we, we put you back mm. in alignment. But you're just not advertised to the osteopath and you're not advertised to the rolfer. So if somebody's like, how do I get my flat feedback? You suggest to them, go see a professional that's a rolfer and you direct them to the Rolf Institute org page, rolf.org. And there's a little button that says, find a rolfer. On the oh. second session, you get this taken care of. Wow. On session two, I became a rolfer. Like I signed up for school. I got off that table and I had arches in my feet and I was like, damn shit straight, what? <laughs> no way you can actually change this and not just like put arches in my blah 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 that's a crutch that's a band-aid that's not fixing it yeah. you're just giving a band-aid that's eventually going to wear out and i have to eventually redo this why don't we just fix it some people are not advertised to the actual person that could fix it and that's Mainly the problem is that we're not advertised to the things that can actually fix us because doctors don't want you to know that because they want you to do blank because it's more money for them in the long run is to keep you unhealthy. Is this is why I don't see my clients ever again. And it sucks. I literally say goodbye to my clients and I barely ever see them again. And then instead of seeing them, they send me their family members which is the best because I don't want to see you again, Yosha, as much as I love you. I don't want to see you in here. I want you to know, like, I want to feel so confident in your body. Like, yeah, everything's still aligned. And then when you feel like things are two millimeters out, you're like, okay, I fucked up. I fell down a couple of times. Okay. Let's put this back. And then you don't see me again for like a year. That's usually what happens. It's so nice not to depend on a therapist every single fucking week. Like a psychotherapist, a psychotherapist's job is to get you eventually out of their office. And if you've been in psychotherapy for 10 years, they're not doing their job very well. Yeah, something psycho. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's amazing. And I've seen the benefits of role thing. And that's why I actually don't have, I haven't been to a doctor in a very long time. I don't really have any other practices and people I don't see in the massage and every once in a while I might if, if you're you know the opportunity arises but really just role playing is the only thing that I've consistently um done in the last few years just because it has been just it's trumped everything else so yeah mm -hmm. well and that's um that is the common thing all of us rolfers here is once I find a rolfer I never leave my rolfer and the one thing that everybody has in common when they come to a rolfer is they've gone everywhere else and they're still looking for change and they find change. Change, well, I love it. I, I know you gotta run, but uh, thank you so much for this, it's been amazing. And I will send people your yeah, let me know as well. Maybe like really refer to the rolf.org page because like all of us are doing the same work. Mm -hmm. um, I would look out to see like, hey, are you, look for Rolf movement practitioners when people are looking for a rolfer. I'm a Rolf movement practitioner with, I'm a certified Rolfer and Rolf movement practitioner. I'm finishing my Rolf movement certification, but I practice Rolfing in here a lot. Rolf movement a lot with my hands on them. And that's called Rolf movement. So when getting people to the right places, make sure they're Rolf movement certified, they don't have to be an advanced Rolfer. Like I'm not an advanced Rolfer, but I have an advanced brain. But I would definitely take a consultation on the phone to see if that person is going to work for them and telling them like not every rolfer is for everybody as you've seen yeah. right yeah. so really encourage them to dive a little deeper and call that person be like are we going to work together 
it's a big, it's a business consultation. Essentially, you don't just like pick up the first role for and be like, well, me, um, are we going to work together? Well, like who have you studied with? Why did you study it? How long have you been studying that? I want to know. Yeah. Are we, I, but I'm picky. I'm kind of picky. Lucky. It's your body. It's important. This yeah. This has been yeah, exactly. Thank you so so yeah. if, if you're focused on your feet and if they really want to get the answers they need, then then come prepared with questions just like you would at a job interview. Mm. I love it when people come with their x-rays and all their shit and I'm like, oh, they prepared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. So, well, yeah. um, love you bunches and I miss you. Love I'll you see too. you yeah. in a couple weeks. Soon. Yeah, it's crazy. We'll be Thanks back soon. soon. Can't wait. Yeah. Thank you again. Hey. Bye. You're welcome. Bye.